Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on issues behind the news. A main theme that emerged at this week's second annual Mining Lakotla was the need for conscientious engagement to turn the mining industry around and achieve improved production and safety levels. Mining Weekly editor Martin Creamer tells us more. Hi Martin. Hi Chanel. The most important aspect of this week's Mining Lakotla was its focus on collaborative partnerships. Can you tell us what Deputy President Khalima Motlante had to say about this? Yes, uh, the President actually arrived not as the Deputy President but as the Acting President because the Cabinet had met and they knew that the President would be away and they said, look, we've got to give gravitas to this meeting because it's a very important meeting. It's more of a process uh, than a talk shop where people actually get together afterwards and thrash things out in, in greater depth in the hopes of reaching solutions. And this collaboration has been going on for two years now. It's not as if we don't have the collaboration. The, 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 we've got a unique partnership in South Africa. No other country's got this close uh, working together you know, of government, business and labor. The problem is the progress is slow. And when you get into these sort of deadlocks, you need to say, guys, we've got to quicken the pace of improvement here. We're not seeing the improvement. We're getting together often, but unfortunately we're saying the same things. And from the government point of view, of course, th they're very keen o on some of these archaic legacies being removed. And uh, the, the deputy president as the acting president, Gelema uh, Matlanto, uh, who is a former miner himself and, and a former union leader, has got a tremendous insight into what's going on. He's also got a lot of respect from the mining community. You know, they, they really think that he's uh, leading the show very, very well. The problem is he has said that he might not be around for the next term uh, because he's indicated that he will be r r leaving politics. So that could leave a bit of a, a, a vacuum. But in the meantime, you know, he's dealing particularly with migrant labor and he wants to see some sort of reform there which I think is crucial. How can the mining industry move forward from the collective effects of past policies? Yeah, you know, th these past policies, one of the worst, uh, and uh, a speaker put it in the lowest rung of hell, in fact, at, at the, uh, one of the speakers, he put migrant labor in the lowest rung of hell because he said of all the apartheid legacies, this was the worst. And we know that there have been a, a sort of a, a zone created where no one wanted to move away from this. I think that because it had been in South Africa for 100 years, not even the workers wanted to go into a different paradigm because uh, it was so deeply entrenched in their communities where they lived away from the rural areas for 12 months at a time, went back for a few weeks, uh, but would remit money there. And what complicated the whole situation was this living out allowance when the, you know, the whole s hostel system changed, where people said you don't have to live in the hostel. The unions insisted, you know, people must be allowed to live elsewhere after 1994, and they took living out allowances. But because they were only temporary sojourners in these urban areas close to the mines, they still saw their real home as a rural home, and they would then use that living allowance. Um, as a sort of an extra salary and their living conditions became very poor. They would cl be close to the mine living in a shack and uh, this has created huge social complications for the mining industry and its reputation and brand has been damaged. A warning was also put forward that the South African mining industry had no future if it failed to innovate. Can you elaborate on that? Well, you know, I think that um, it, it was a great contribution from uh, um, Mark Kutafani as, as the president of, of the Chamber of Mines and Peter Schwartz coming in as the keynote speaker, you know, from, from the U.S. And their message was clear from uh, Mark Kudafani. You know, he was saying, it's productivity, productivity, productivity. If we don't have this, we've got no future. And Peter Schwartz was saying, it's innovation, it's innovation, it's innovation. If you don't do that, you know, you've got no future. And the two go together because the innovation has got to give the extra productivity. You know, the old issue of people taking a long time to travel to the face and then only having a few hours to drill and then prepare the blasting system and then leave the mine after which the blasting takes place means that they are not working a, a, a long day. Uh, they're working hours 
but they're not productive hours. And as we get deeper, it gets uh, more and more crucial to try and increase this productivity. We are really not competitive. This was the whole theme, that how do we become more competitive in South Africa? Because we're not competitive. And you have to innovate to do that. And I think one person who's proved that you can innovate with huge success is the president of the Chamber of Mines of South Africa at the moment, Mark Kudafani, because he introduced a system in the gold mining sector, an automated system. He leapt over mechanization and he went into a mechanical uh, rock cutting system that is really uh, impressing everyone. And he's saying it's not going to be proprietary to any one company. You know, they're prepared to spread it and allow everyone to use it, which is very generous because he's saying, number one, it, it creates safety, and number two, it actually helps you to generate fantastic production on a 24-hour basis. So that is the sort of solution you need in South Africa. You've got to come through with something that works, uh, and he has done that, and at the same time, it gives you that productivity because it allows you to uh, avoid the old blasting tradition uh, so that um, you can work 24 hours a day you know, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and you almost got as your materials on tap. They come flying out, gold or platinum in the hard rock sense with this innovation that, that has been uh, introduced. So all of them have got their thinking caps on. All are looking to the mine of the future, which is going to be automated, even to a great extent. And they're using the word automation beyond mechanization, so they want to take a leap. And other industries have led the way. It's not as if they've got to reinvent the wheel. So they can take a lot from the automotive industry. They can take a lot from uh, manufacturing sectors. They can take a lot from the IT sector. And they can apply them to mining. What role can the unions play in the sustainability of the mining industry? So, you know, the unions have got to realize that the name of the game is production. And uh, you, you, you can't actually get more than you're putting in. Uh, you can't have above inflation increases over a 10 year period and not match it with productivity because then you have no future. The sustainability just goes out of the industry and no one can eventually pay you those levels of pay that, that you think are, are correct. So a reskilling is also demanded of, of by the unions. They are saying, look, if you're going to automate or if you're going to mechanize, you know, start upskilling us. What are these further education training colleges around the place? Why don't we use them? You know, why don't we, um, when we're introducing something new, send us to college to do the theory and then we come back and do the practical. Then we go and do more theory and come back. So that if you have to reduce your numbers because of the automation or because of the mechanization, we will be employable in other sectors. But at the moment we're not. <laughs> We're not employable. You know, we can't go into another sector. And, and so that therefore we cling to our jobs. We don't want to lose these jobs. And <clears throat> we do want extra pay. So I think the bigger picture must be seen by the unions. And we must get a new vision. And everybody must close ranks behind this vision. And, and it must be a, a vision that has benefit for South Africa. It's got to benefit the South African economy. South Africa first was the theme of the Lekhotla, you know, this week. And that's the only way to do it. But then you've got a leader. You've got to have a leader who convinces you that that's the correct way to go. And then let's put our backs behind that um, direction and make sure that we are competitive. I mean, just look on the safety side, how well people are doing at the moment. You know, th there's a truly remarkable progress in safety. It's, it's better uh, than um, what has taken place in the US. It's better than what's taken place in Canada. And Canada used to be the benchmark. You know, the Ontario benchmark used to be it because that was also deep level mines. So we could compare them with South African mines. I think their uh, safety improvement over 10 years was 25%. Ours has been 66%. So if we continue trending the way we are over the next 10 years, we will be the benchmark, the world benchmark when it comes to mine safety. And those are the things that we need to aspire to, aspire to being at the top. Because at the moment, we are at the bottom. And always when you have a crisis, you must, you must make the best use of a crisis.
you know, turn it to positive account. South Africa has been known to do that in the past. They're good with crises. You know, when our backs are to the wall, we suddenly realize that, um, you know, we've got to have a solution. Then we start moving forward. But at the moment, there doesn't seem to be anyone who can lead us out of the deadlock, which is quite worrying. Thanks for chatting to us, Martin. It's a great pleasure, Chanel. That's the show for today. Join us again next time for more news and insight into what's happening in the mining world.